Welcome to Tangents, a podcast based on a series of odd conversations between two friends. At the time of this recording, President Donald Trump has antagonized Kim Jong-un, the dictator of North Korea, to the point where we might actually get an actual flaming ball, giant flaming ball of death. And joining me is someone who knows quite a bit about both antagonizing and foreign policy in general, my good friend Thomas. Hello, Thomas. Good morning, Josh. So, Thomas, what is the immediate crisis on the Korean Peninsula? Can you can you tell me a little bit about Trump and North Korea? Sure. So, uh, problems began to emerge uh, between the U.S. and North Korea. Obviously, we've had it for a long time. But right at the tail end of the Obama administration, um, North Korea started ramping up its nuclear program, including apparently doing a test right before Trump's inauguration. But the really frightening crisis of the past few weeks began on July 28th uh, when the DPRK tested an intercontinental ballistic missile that could potentially have reached the West Coast with a range of about um, 10,500 kilometers. That's uh, in significantly res- higher than any previously recorded range by an yeah. Korean missile. Really, uh, what we had been talking about for many years prior to this was potentially it being able to strike Japan uh, or other U.S. allies in the region, maybe potentially U.S. territories, which I'll get into in a second, but certainly not the actual continental United States. Mm. And this uh, was confirmed uh, independently um, by intelligence analysts. So in response to this on August 5th, the U.N. Security Council significantly, very significantly, unanimously passed Resolution 2371, putting additional sanctions on North Korea, including on foodstuffs and raw materials, which the regime is really dependent on, as are its immiserated people. Wait, 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 uh, Thomas, Thomas, Thomas. Sure. Can you tell me the last time the UN Security Council has unanimously passed anything else? I couldn't off of the top of my head, certainly not something this consequential. Uh, okay. but so this is not critical this is not about a this circumstance then. Yeah, what's critical about this is right. that Russia and China were in the affirmative uh, on well, this. Russia and China important. both immediately criticized North Korea's uh, u- testing of this intercontinental ballistic missile. Mm-hmm. Uh, you, you are seeing in the international community one of the rare instances where there, I don't know that I'd call this collective security, but certainly collective global opinion on lines that are usually fractured, uh, especially Russia and China now agreeing with the United States and criticizing North Korea. So these sanctions were passed, and I'll talk about Mm -hmm. why they don't really matter that much in a minute. But on August 8th, uh, a leaked Defense Intelligence Agency report, I think it was in the New York Times. Uh, it was, as a matter of in- fact. Yeah, it was. Uh, indicated um, that North Korea might have achieved what's called miniaturization. Um, mm-hmm. It's able to put nuclear warheads uh, uh, on ICBMs and be able to deliver nuclear warheads. So it, it's its intercontinental ballistic missiles are a lot more threatening than we thought. And in response to this, President Trump uh, threatened North Korea with fire and fury, uh, his words, even if, if they even thought uh, about uh, attacking the United States. He said this, according again to the New York Times, apparently without the approval of the National Security Council uh, or other national security or his defense officers. advisors. Yeah, he, okay. he, the White House mm-hmm. said these that he, he used his own words, but that the sentiment had been vetted um, by his advisors. This is almost certainly a lie. Uh, He was very likely speaking, at least according to the Times as reporting, and anyone who's reasonably uh, followed the patterns that President Trump's speech had done in the past. Uh, He Mm -hmm. made this very bellicose rhetoric off the top. So in response to this a day later, uh, North Korea threatened to shoot missiles off the coast of Guam, a U.S. territory, mm-hmm. which is not unprecedented. North Korea has th- made extreme threats in the past, but given the much tougher rhetoric that's coming from the White House and the apparent instability of American leadership, never mind North Korean leadership, <laughs> it has some people, uh, many people, especially in Guam, really worried. 
Additionally, uh, given the increased military capability of North Korea, they would likely have been able to do this pretty easily. Yes, uh, and uh, North Korea has threatened to attack the U.S. in the past. North Korea has threatened to attack South Korea on a regular basis. North Korea has made lots of extreme threats in the past, but what's new here is that Amer is that the American administration is rhetorically responding in kind with extreme statements rather than kind of treating North Korea like the basket case that it is, at mm -hmm. least as, as it's rhetoric. So on August 10th, Trump said that fire and fury was probably not tough enough, uh, and uh, there was concern that tensions would ratchet up greater, although on August 15th, it does appear that Kim Jong-un has shelved uh, the, the plan to test missiles near Guam. The president's supporters say that his tough rhetoric uh, deterred North Korea. Uh, critics say that American capabilities, which existed regard, which I'll get into in a second, which existed regardless of the president's rhetoric, deterred North Korea, which tends to act a bit more rationally than its words, and that the president's rhetoric mm -hmm. is not all helping the situation. Okay. So, Thomas, is there anything else important on this reporting on North Korea's capabilities? Well, beyond um, the critical uh, revelation of nuclear of, uh, of North Korea's uh, miniaturization capability, it revealed to us that uh, the North Korean nuclear program is proceeding a lot faster and it's a lot more advanced than we originally thought. They mm. seem to have made a lot more progress uh, uh, on the nuclear program uh, than, than original estimates have been before the report was released, and that right. further escalated tensions. Yes. Um, and, it's, and before our listeners decide to um, head to the nearest fallout shelter... There aren't is, many left. Well, there aren't any left, one. Um, and it, two, it is important to note that North Korea, in order for North Korea to be able to strike at the continental United States, they would have to have what's called a credible re-entry device for their uh, miniaturized nuclear weapons. Yes, and, yes. And which they don't currently have. The reason this, why they... This refers to uh, if the missile is shot up into the atmosphere, it has to be able to come back to Earth without breaking up. Yes, and we're, not, we're currently... The, the defense estimates, even in this report, currently state that North Korea does not have this, but could potentially acquire it as early as early 2018. This is highly significant because, like Thomas said, this is this is much earlier than we thought that they were going to be able to gain this technology. Previous estimates put it at 2020 or 2021. So what makes this such a problem uh I'm still going to assert, and we'll talk more about this in a minute, that mm. there's kind of an asymmetric situation here with North Korea. Maybe not asymmetric in terms of asymmetric warfare, which is what we mean when we say like the conventional army versus like the Taliban. But right. there's an asymmetry. Obviously, America is much more powerful than North Korea. And America is much more powerful uh, compared to North Korea than it was to, say, the Soviet Union, which there's, was weaker, but right. it was more evenly matched. There's an but, equal power distribution at play here is what you're saying. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but nonetheless, as the program advances, its ability to cause some damage potentially to the United States is more than enough to threaten America, which is right. what ratchets up tensions. Okay. Uh, so, Thomas, this might seem like a, a bit of an obvious question, but uh, what are the risks of nuclear war with North Korea? And, and more importantly, what are the risks of confrontation of North Korea generally? Um, I, they're primarily in miscalculation. Uh, okay. it, it's, I don't need to tell our listeners, it's not rational for any actor to initiate a nuclear war. Nobody wins a nuclear war. No, we all um, But... As during the Cold War with uh, the Cuban Missile Crisis and the somewhat lesser known Operation Able Archer in the 1980s, mm -hmm. miscalculation and misunderstanding uh, are what could potentially lead to tragedy. Uh, besides its nuclear capability, North Korea has enormous numbers of artillery pieces and conventional weapons. Mm -hmm. uh, pointed at Seoul, which is not far from the demilitarized zone separating North and South Korea. Mm -hmm. Seoul is one of the biggest cities in the world, one of the biggest metropolitan areas in the world. It has about 10 million residents. That's about 
one third of South Korea's population. Yeah, it's I'm a, sorry, that's about one fifth one of fifth, South Korea's one population. It's about one third of North Korea's population. Yeah, it's about one third of North Korea's population, one fifth of South Korea's population. There's there's 50 million South Koreans, 30 million North Koreans. We don't know exactly how many North Koreans, but it's a lot of people. Mm-hmm. Uh, and if the U.S. were to launch some kind of preemptive strike, uh, which has been put on the table by the ha- the most hawkish of hawks uh, in the U.S., North Korea could certainly be obliterated, but it could obliterate Seoul um, before uh, it uh, is taken out by American nuclear weapons. Uh, so that alone makes it really different from other preemptive wars like we've had in the past. Now, Iraq didn't have weapons of mass destruction when no, America not. invaded in 2003, but Iraq also really wasn't positioned to do any kind of damage the way North Korea could do to Seoul with conventional weapons. It's a, a much more dangerous situation. I hesitate to make comparisons, but I'd say it's a bit like trying to uh, use a sniper to take out uh, somebody who's holding a hostage right in front of them. Basically, Seoul is a human shield mm. for North Korea. Uh so the risks are absolutely enormous. More distantly, there's a risk of a confrontation between the U.S. and China. I'll talk about China's okay. position in more detail in a minute. But uh, just to remind our listeners of the history of this, when uh, the United States went to war on the Korean Peninsula in the early 1950s during the Truman administration, when American troops uh, swept North Korean uh, forces all the way up to the Yalu River mm. on the Chinese border, uh, China entered the war and totally changed the balance in yes. the U.S. and China. I believe that this was before China had nuclear weapons, but mm. uh, the U.S. and China were engaged in direct confrontation. And obviously, is, China's a lot more powerful now, right, yes. a lot greater U.S. adversary. The risk is immense. All the, 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 uh, the consequences would be immense. I would say the risk of a fight, a direct conflict between the U.S. and China is about the same as one between uh, America and Russia over Syria. It's 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 a, a high, it's a low probability, high consequence event. But and all mm-hmm. sides recognize how bad it right. would be. I think it's in Sun Tzu's Art of War where he says that it's very important to know your enemy. So other than the fact that North Korea is a totalitarian dictatorship ruled totalitarian. by totalitarian dictatorship, yes, ruled by some crazy imbecile with nuclear weapons who has the capability to, to harm a metropolitan area of 10 million people who, had, who has frequent human rights abuses, sent back um, uh, one of a, a UVA student named Otto Warmbier and some yes. kind of horrible yeah. And that, that's the background of the, some of the background of the current tensions. In which he originally passed away. What can you tell us about the history of North Korea? Well, as I alluded to, North Korea was founded uh, after the Korean War uh, when the the conflict had a ceasefire, uh, I believe in, in 1952 or 1953, uh, at a demilitarized zone. So the South became uh, sort of a military dictatorship and then eventually a democracy, and the North a totalitarian communist dictatorship, backed actually primarily by the USSR. Uh, although having a re- obviously having a relationship with China. So it, it had a lot of aid, North Korea did, from the USSR. And when the Soviet Union fell in 1991, much like uh-huh. Cuba and other parts uh, of, uh, of the second world, mm-hmm. uh, North Korea lost its sponsor. There was an extreme famine after this. Uh, just a, a couple of years after the Soviet Union fell, the North Korea's founding leader and totalitarian dictator, demigod Kim Il-sung died, mm-hmm. and his shorter cartoonish uh, relative Kim Jong-il assumed the leadership, the, the father of Kim Jong-il. Thomas, current. Thomas yeah. did you know that Kim Jong-il was reportedly born under two double rainbows and that he neither defecates nor urinates like a normal human? Did you, you read? That? You read this from a credible source, I'm sure. I read this from the most credible source in North Korea. <laughs> the state media. The, exactly, the state media. If so they don't know what's going slightly, on, slightly so slightly more credibility than Breitbart. Then uh, I would say slightly <laughs> less credibility than the Daily Stormer, actually. <laughs> uh, <laughs> 
So um, there was a, an enormous famine, one of the worst famines of the 20th century after the Soviet Union fell in North Korea. It's not sure. It, nobody really knows exactly how many people died, but was it, it was it was m probably many hundreds of thousands uh, mm, who died in North Korea after the Soviet Union fell. The economy has never really recovered. Mm -hmm. It's been a deeply, deeply isolated ever since. Right. At the same time as China increasingly moved toward integrating into the American system. Uh, a Russian Federation, no longer a superpower, just a great power within its own sphere and having its own problems. Uh -huh. So North Korea has been pretty isolated since. Uh, right. And uh, that, that isolation, I would assert, and I'll talk about this a little more in a minute, is what led it to seek to develop a nuclear weapons program to try to preserve its regime. Mm -hmm. So can you tell me a little bit about what conventional American policy is towards North Korea, Thomas? Do we use a policy of deterrence, and how effective is that? Yes, we do. As I alluded to before, the U.S. has a massive nuclear arsenal of over 4,000 nuclear weapons. I we also have the most nuclear weapons in the world, as a matter of fact. Well, of any country in the world. Yeah, of any country. Uh, and uh, we also have... Uh, 29,000 uh, conventional armed forces in North Korea. The U.S. has also been attempting to come in up... In South Korea, not North Korea. I don't in South Korea. Korea. In South Korea, yes. Yeah. troops in North yeah. Korea. Yeah. Yeah. God, in, we've in, launched an yeah. invasion. Yes, uh. yes. South Korea. In South Korea, we have 29,000 29, conventional forces. The U.S. has also been attempting to develop um, missile defense systems. The, the THAAD missile defense mm -hmm. uh, has been among... Uh, the options the U.S. has been considering right. to try to attempt to counter uh, North Korean strike. Um, the U.S. has also pursued diplomatic routes to attempt uh, to, to prevent and eventually get North Korea to give up its nuclear weapons program. So under the early Clinton administration, there were negotiations when North Korea was still developing its nuclear program. That failed. Uh, North Korea got nuclear weapons in 2003. The Bush administration tried again in 2005 um, to get North Korea to give them up. But as I've said before, um, North Korea wants nuclear weapons to preserve the stability uh, of its regime. Mm -hmm. So it's very unlikely to give them up. Sanctions have been another option that's considered both uh, uh, bilaterally, multilaterally, and mm -hmm. through international organizations like the UN. Reality is sanctions are never likely to be effective on okay. a country that's not particularly integrated into the global economy to begin with, and a country that has, where there are few domestic actors that have leverage over the regime that are going to be Right. by them. Okay. North Korea doesn't care how many of its people are immiserated. Um, North Korea would certainly really. like to have sanctions lifted and to get more raw materials, but it sees nuclear weapons as a matter of survival for the regime. Right. And the primary goal of the North Korean regime, as with most regimes, uh, is its own survival. Right. And so sanctions aren't likely to work. An additional problem with sanctions, okay. uh, and <clears throat> uh, a number of experts uh, have commented on this, is that the, the more countries you involve in a sanctions regime, the more likely there is to be cheating. So if China stops sending raw materials to North Korea, Mm -hmm. uh, West African countries, and there have been reports of this, West African countries could boost their 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 exports to North Korea. Uh, other right. countries, um, other countries uh, might step in where sanctions are uh, where, where 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 one country stops sending stuff, other countries might yeah, jump yeah, yeah, in yeah, yeah, yeah. opportunity. It's a collective action problem, right. basically. Yeah, uh, so essentially so, the issue is that we have too many moving parts, and even if one of them sends raw materials to North Korea, sanctions really have kind of been averted at yeah. some point. So really, there there aren't a whole lot of options as far as North Korea is concerned. Okay. Would you like to hear my policy prescription, Josh? Sure. Why, why not, Thomas? Please <clears> give us your right. policy so I, this is going to be a theme uh, of my discussion going forward, but... Um, 
I would assert to you, as with a lot of diplomatic problems, that there are no good options in North Korea right now. No, there's the there's a less bad option, and we need to pick that one. Yeah, and that's often the case in diplomacy. There could, mm -hmm. it's not overwhelmingly likely, but there could be a good option in the future. Oh, in North okay. Korea. Oh, great. So, Optimism. if <laughs> well, if there is a possibility, it's very simple mm -hmm. diplomatic logic. If conditions right now are not favorable to a good diplomatic outcome, then the best route to take is to kick the can to kick the can down the road to a time to such a time as when options are better, to when so, the North Korean regime is more amenable, right. uh, to when they might might consider diplomacy better if there's domestic reform uh, within North Korea or if their people revolt and overthrow their their leadership. So the best thing to do is to just preserve the status quo, which right. sucks, and not to escalate, but you're probably not going to have much hope of having them give up either. And I would argue that that's kind of been the default U.S. position before now and that it's likely to continue to be. That, that, that sounds about right. So what you're essentially saying is that we need to maintain a holding pattern of sorts to keep North Korea in the same situation that it was in two years ago and that it's in now yeah. as opposed to trying to get North Korea to back down and actually change the situation seeing as conditions within North Korea are not currently very favorable to any option that the United States might be trying to obtain. Precisely. Uh, we have a very, very strong deterrent capability. Indeed. I think history and literature and the literature on this subject is compelling that deterrence works. Miscalculation is right. a huge risk, which is why uh, under no circumstances should we escalate things. Thomas, it's Thomas, why what Trump is doing is dangerous, which Thomas, I'll get into in a minute. Thomas, one of the main arguments I've seen against deterrence is that mm -hmm. Kim Jong-un is not, in fact, a reasonable actor. Can you speak to that at all? Um, yes. I think that what we've seen from the North Korean regime is that its rhetoric doesn't really conform to its actions. So very similar and to Donald Trump. Just the past, well, I, I don't know about him, <laughs> oh, but <okay. laughs> just, I'm really sad to say, but just in the past few weeks, <laughs> what you've seen is North Korea threatened to test missiles off of the U.S. territory and then basically pulled back uh, when they considered the consequences. Mm -hmm. Um if you are inclined to believe that Kim Jong-un can't be determined, there's really no argument I can make that's going to convince you of that. Right. But I would like to know, even if you think he is undeterrable, what the other options are. And I don't think there are any. I mean, uh, if he's undeterrable, options. if he's undeterrable, there's going to be a crisis come what may. If he is deterrable, then we should maintain deterrence. And that's what I advocate we do. We maintain deterrence. We have the capability to maintain deterrence ad infinitum. Mm. Uh, North Korea does not. No. Uh, and North Korea will eventually break. spend all its resources, its government will be overthrown, or miraculously, this is the less likely scenario, a North Korean Gorbachev will emerge who will try to integrate North Korea into the international order, mm -hmm. and then we will be able to get North Korea to negotiate out its nuclear weapons program. Mm -hmm. I think that's not particularly likely, but mm. it's certainly possible. Current conditions don't work for North Korea to give out its nuclear right. weapons program. Yeah. We're, it's almost yeah, a rhetorical exercise, Josh, okay. for American officials to say North Korea needs to give up its nuclear weapons. They know it's not going to do it. So it, it, it's talk, it's talking tough as opposed to acting tough, very similar yeah. to... And, and you really don't think that we should take Kim Jong-un at his words at the moment. You, you think that he's also sort of engaging in like a talking tough kind of policy. Yeah, I think... I think there's real evidence that his talking tough is for domestic consumption. But I just want to point out the alternative again, based on the undeterrable argument. Okay. And it, it takes a little thinking to get around this. Right. Let's say he's, his threats are serious. Okay. Uh, are we ready to respond to those threats? The answer is yes. Yeah. I'm is there anything that. to be gained by responding as though his threats are serious when we're already ready to respond? Is there anything to be gained by escalating further, even if he is serious? No, I, I don't In the think event, there there's a much greater likelihood that he's not. No, I don't, I don't think so. So we're ready to respond to if he shoots missiles off Guam. So yes. there's no sense in increasing the tension. There's no Let's just sit here right. and be okay. ready to respond. We can beat the shit out of North Korea. Uh, 
if they do something we don't like. If we North shouldn't. Korea we shouldn't give North Korea reason to believe that we're about to engage in a preemptive strike when right. hopefully, hopefully we're not going to do that. Yeah. So, yes. I, I, That's I, why I advocate restraint. Right. Okay. I can completely understand because that. Because perception does create reality and vice versa. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And sometimes perception is more important than reality. It's much more important, particularly when, again, we're probably not much better prepared than we would be in any other situation to respond to a Korean strike. Sure. And the cost of escalating is much greater than the benefit. So right. better not escalate. Okay. And this Thomas? is, this, 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 uh, you know, this, this was pointed out after, for instance, uh, the Soviet accidental shooting down of a South Korean jetliner in the early eighties. Okay. Uh, and other risky situations involving nuclear weapons in the mm -hmm. past. It's, Particularly when you are, and we were probably at a more even position with the Soviet Union at that time. When you are at such an overwhelming advantage already, why, why, why make things worse? Right, I can completely understand that. Um, and one final question, if I might, sure. about this, Thomas. So you're essentially arguing, and I think that most American citizens and more importantly, military officials would agree with you that if North Korea engages in any kind of military conflict with the United States or any strike against South Korea, it will be doing so at the risk of its own complete and total annihilation. Right. Um, do you think Kim Jong-un knows that? Do you think his military yeah. advisors are aware of the fact? Yes, I think they're very aware of that. Okay. I think they've been aware of that for a long time. Okay. Um, so but it, it's not about... For North Korea and for other states that have sought nuclear weapons in the past, North Korea is not seeking to become an equivalent nuclear power to the United States. North yeah. Korea is not seeking to get uh, to achieve sort of a mad equivalency with the United States. Right. It doesn't need to do that. It just needs to be able to do a little damage. It needs to, to be able to, to deter the to United deter, States. To deter the United States from overthrowing its regime. Right. It, it doesn't need to be to the point to where... America thinks that the entire United States could be obliterated by North Korea. North Korea doesn't have enough resources to get to that point. It just yeah. needs to be able to cause some damage. And it, I'd say it's been pretty successful at that, frankly. I would I would agree with that. Just as a way of driving this point home, I have a question for you. Oh, okay. So can you name for me um, the countries uh, that have tried to get nuclear weapons since the end of the Cold War. Just name a few. Okay. Either tried and succeeded, aside from North Korea. Tried and succeeded? Or, tried or succeeded. Tried or succeeded. Okay. Other than North Korea. Um, uh, Pakistan? Yes, 1997-98. Worst, by the way, closest the world has come to nuclear war since the Cold War. Just a terrifying... Yes terrifying situation if you read it and by the way if you want proof that deterrence works not a single war between india and pakistan since the 90s um iraq yes that's that example's clear failed iran yes and maybe libya yeah so uh other than pakistan what do all those countries have in common uh they all failed to obtain nuclear weapons oh well north korea succeeded well but north korea succeeded these what, are all countries. What other country what other what other things do those countries have in common? And let's just exclude Pakistan. Okay, these are all countries that are not ally, not allied with the United States or were not allied with the United States or part of a global order when they tried to obtain nuclear weapons. Precisely. And all of them wanted to preserve their regimes. Right, yes. So I, I would assert to you that that's the main driver, uh, if I just to drive the point home sure. of, of, of countries' need for nuclear weapons. I'm going to go back to England uh, in the 17th century. Uh, of course. Yes, I might. So this is tangents. <laughs> and, uh, uh, you know, I, I'm going to go as far away from our topic uh, as, 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 as thought, conceivably possible. As I conceivably could during the English Civil War when Cavaliers and Roundheads um, were fighting. Uh, Thomas Hobbes wrote his book, uh, Leviathan, in 1651 as he was watching England descend into chaos. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And what he asserted was that in order to have human society to be successful, people had to submit to a Leviathan, this great overwhelming force. Uh, 
lest they to, succumb to a life that was all too nasty, brutish, and brutish short. And short. Correct. Mm -hmm. um, and and you, you've clearly read Hobbes' classic. I here. have absolutely read Hobbes' classic. Hobbes uh, was an IR theorist. Uh, okay. And uh, he was just predicting uh, mm -hmm. a theory known as hegemonic stability theory. Hegemonic uh, stability theory. Okay. Yeah, hegemonic stability theory goes much the same way, that the world is in a much a much more stable condition uh, when you have uh, a hegemon, uh, an overwhelming force like a leviathan, to keep order in the world. Mm -hmm. This is a, a theory that has been advocated by uh, many great IR theorists, uh, among them uh, right. Bob Cohen, uh, John G. Mearsheimer, Mm -hmm. uh, Stephen Cra Stephen Krasner wrote the classic book on it. Rod Robert Gilpin wrote yes. Robert Gilpin's book is probably the most well known on. I, I, I know Gilpin's book. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's a classic. Mm -hmm. But uh, I would assert to you, you know, countries like Luxembourg, the mm -hmm. Netherlands, right. Germany, yes. uh, Japan, okay. uh, are all a part of this American-led order, and they've sort of subcontracted out their nuclear defense capabilities to the United States. The reason Japan, which is, I'd say, pretty threatened, probably more than Luxembourg, with nuclear obliteration, mm -hmm. doesn't need nuclear weapons is that the U.S. does it for it. Right. Uh, so Iraq didn't have this. No. Uh, Libya didn't have this. No. Japan didn't have the. Excuse me, uh, North Korea didn't have this. No. Uh, and so they needed nuclear weapons. They don't have the Leviathan's protection. And that's pretty critical to understanding their behavior. They are much more reactive. They are much more defensive. They are constantly much more threatened with the base needs of survival because they right. haven't submitted to the hegemon, to the Leviathan. Not only have they not submitted to the hegemon, but in some respects they're trying to challenge the hegemon. They're trying to protect themselves from the hegemon. Yeah, I don't think they're trying to... to I wouldn't use the word replace. challenge, because challenge would suggest... Challenge like suggests that replacement. Yeah, that's, I, that's your point. yeah, yeah, they're not. Okay. People even think that of China, and we can have we'll have maybe a nice debate in a minute as to whether or not that's the case. I would assert to you at the present moment that it, China's at least partially under the protection of the Leviathan too, or it's at least working with the Leviathan with the right. United States. But nobody would say that North Korea is. Nobody would say that North Korea thinks it's going to replace the United States. But it has to be reactive and defensive because. To North Korea, it is a war of every man against every man. If I might channel Hobbes again for a minute, um, do you think that? Do you, do you think that um, using some an example that I know a little bit better? I know a little bit more about Iran than I do about a lot of other places. Yeah. Um, Iran, when negotiating with the United States, wants to be seen on not an equal level, but they want to be able to have some negotiating power, yes. and that's really part of the reason why they sought nuclear weapons, in order to have that kind of, not, not really yes, power leverage. over the United States, but leverage to negotiate with the United States. Is that really what North Korea is looking for here, if the United States should seek to negotiate with it? Yes, uh, and I wouldn't say it's just doing it with nuclear weapons. It does it more or less with every foreign policy tactic that it has. North okay. Korea escalates, has a, has, a pers has a persistent pattern of escalating and then using de-escalation as a bargaining chip. And ah, I would put okay. the people that it imprisons, Americans like Otto Warmbier, uh, as bargaining chips. Yes. Which we don't need to describe the perverted logic of stealing somebody's iPod and then trying to negotiate with them and giving them back the iPod mm. uh, as a bargaining chip. Uh, yes. That's that's fucked up, uh, but that's what North Korea it's does. Essentially, it, it's essentially some kind of form of blackmail. In all yeah, honesty. It, yeah, it is a basically blackmail. Uh, and I'd point out, I think North Korea is even more isolated, Extortion. even more than even more cut out of the international order than Iran is. Iran's a okay. lot bigger and more advanced. That's but very true. That's, that's a, that's a fair comment. that's a fair point. Okay. So uh, I'm going to look at maybe one example that you discussed about another country that was outside the American oh, order sure. that that did develop nuclear weapons, and that's Libya. Okay. Libya under its hysterical cartoon of a dictator, Muammar Gaddafi. Uh, Gave up its Thomas, nuclear weapons. Thomas, Thomas, tangential sure. question. How do you spell Gaddafi? Because I've seen it spelled like 19 different ways. Mm, let's find out right now. 
I've well, seen it spelled as essentially Quadafi. I've seen the G Wikipedia Fried. spells it G A D D A F I. Uh, it's an Arabic name. Uh, so just like Mohammed or Muhammad. Uh, right. Oh, okay. So, so it can have a few different. It can have a, maybe a few different spellings. And bear in mind that they speak a different version of Arabic in Libya than standard modern Arabic. That's that a, makes sense. That's another fun discussion. So, so, so back to our back yes. to our Libya. So Libya gives up its its nuclear weapons in the early two thousands, right? Right. So then comes the Arab Spring. We'll we'll do we'll do a, another episode about the Arab Spring and about how that's gone because that's a great discussion. But the Arab um, Spring or the Islamist Winter. Yeah, really. But uh, <laughs> the Libyan the Libyan people uh, and parts of the Libyan military rise up to overthrow Gaddafi finally. Right. Um, he's eventually, I think, beheaded. He's he's killed in his hometown. Yes, there's, he was beheaded. There's actually video of him like being that. chased and murdered. Mm -hmm. uh, after the U.S. Uh, the U.S. led from behind, apparently, uh, a humanitarian effort to stop what they saw as a legitimate possibility of genocide occurring uh, in Benghazi, uh, mm -hmm. to use the accent of former British Foreign Secretary. Uh, at the time, uh, mm -hmm. and William Hague, uh, and yes. uh, this, I would argue, set a very bad precedent, a horrible What was precedent. that bad precedent, Thomas? Well, you tell a country to give up its nuclear weapons, and if you give up its nuclear weapons, we're not going to overthrow the regime, and what do we do? Overthrow the regime. Yeah, so nobody else wants to ever give up nuclear weapons again. Oh, that's, so, that was really not smart, was it? No. Um. Well, it kind of... If you really think that there was a, such a catastrophic humanitarian risk as Samantha Power and Hillary Clinton and others in the Obama administration at the time were asserting, that's why we, we did the intervention in Libya. But the results in Libya and the precedent that it set was not a good one. Yeah, there is a, a global mandate to intervene if you believe that crimes of genocide are occurring. Yes. So now that we've talked a little bit about what we have done in the past and more importantly what we should do in the future, Let's talk about Donald Trump's foreign policy, if in fact he does have one. Do you think Trump has a foreign policy, Thomas? No. Uh, uh, oh, that's, really that's other, really, really other than, than a somewhat cack-handed attempt to retreat from the, the global order as we know it, uh, right. th there really isn't anything as sophisticated uh, as policy going on for Trump. We have about 50 years, Josh, of more than 50 years of history uh, regarding North Korea's behavior to right. try to predict what's going to happen there. We don't have nearly as much for Trump, sadly, uh, or maybe not sadly. Uh, I don't so, want a 50-year presidency for Donald Trump, Thomas. No, no, no that's, that would be undesirable. Um, I would but, move somewhere else. But uh, many analysts of the current crisis say that the factor that actually seems most unpredictable is Trump. You, as with many other issues, seem to be having multiple, again, policies in inverted commas coming out of the Trump administration. So the president has been issuing his comments of fire and fury uh, and just the most bellicose, macho, machismo, bullshit, dangerous rhetoric you can imagine regarding North Korea. Whereas uh, Secretary of State Rex Tillerson, Secretary of Defense James Mattis and other officials have intensely stressed uh, diplomacy and the need for diplomatic options. I have to just say, Josh, when mm -hmm. the Secretary of Defense is talking up diplomacy, uh, that's pretty unprecedented. <laughs> that's that's pretty usually bad. usually that's one um, the, the the old saying goes in bureaucracies that where one stands depends on where one sits. Mm -hmm. um, Mattis gave comments to reporters the other day, uh, I believe on a visit to South Korea, uh, saying that his job is to have defensive options available for the president only after diplomatic options have been exhausted. He repeatedly said that we're engaging in diplomacy as much as possible, that he has confidence in his colleagues at the State Department. Again, coming from someone who works for the Pentagon, that's pretty incredible. Didn't, but, didn't Rex uh, Tillerson essentially say to ignore Donald Trump and to go to sleep easily? <laughs> he he said 
so what happened was is Tillerson made comments saying that we're engaged in diplomacy and he doesn't think we need to go into preemptive war. Trump makes fire and fury comments. And then locked and loaded um, comments. Sarah Huckabee Sanders, the, the, the press secretary, uh, bless her heart, uh, says the president is the commander in chief. You need to listen to what he says. So she's basically saying ignore Tillerson. And then the State Department spokes person, spokeswoman, I can't remember her name, uh, says, you know, the secretary is the he secretary of state, the head of the State Department, you need to listen to what he says. So I don't know who we're supposed to be listening to as far as this government. Uh, well, and well, yet well, again, well, Thomas, we have different officials Thomas, in the administration on different Thomas, pages. Thomas, I think we're locked and loaded for diplomacy. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so really unclear what the administration is trying to achieve here. Mm -hmm. Um Trump has this really um, juvenile perspective on international politics that's, that's been clear that's from the moment and, and many other issues from the moment he assumed office. Right. He seems to view everything uh, as a kind of transactional situation, most frighteningly when he suggested that the one China policy could be up for negotiation regarding China's uh, trade practices with the U.S., and he no, seems to no. see North Korea as having similar possibility that if China helps the U.S. on North Korea, then we might go easier on China on trade, uh, which the idea that these things are connected uh, is disturbing. Is very disturbing that anyone would perceive foreign policy in that way. So I think that brings us to China, Josh, if you'd like to hear about well, what they Well, I'd think like to about. ask one more sure. question about Donald Trump. So sure. you said that Donald just Trump one. is conceived of as just one, I promise, as the most sort of unpredictable actor in this sense. Earlier, I asked you if you thought North Korea can be deterred. Now I'm going to ask you, do you think Donald Trump can be deterred? Um, yes. Okay. Uh, probably. Uh, That's not a good answer. I, I don't perceive that I, I perceive that the administration wants to avoid a bloodbath in Seoul. I would I would assume uh, so. I would assume so. I would hope I, so. I would hope so. Although the events of the past week really do seem to suggest that the president doesn't seem to have normal human empathy in regard to violence and yes. the ability for massive self-delusion in regard to violence. Um, if I think, our listeners would like to know about that, they should listen to the episode. It was not a battle. I mean, it was not a rally. It was a battle. Yes, um, we strongly recommend listening strongly to recommend that, that episode, episode. Um, probably with maybe uh, an ad of van or two on hand. Yeah. Um, listen to some relaxing music before and after. It'll help. Yes. Uh, yeah, we, we, uh, we, we strongly recommend Wagner. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that was that was a good joke. Uh that was a really good joke. Oh, that was a very good joke. Oh, back, yeah. back, Trump, Trump, back to Trump. Back yeah, to Trump. so like I was saying with Kim, so I think that the administration's aware that millions of people could die if they get this wrong, which is why I think very likely they're going to kick this can down the road like everybody else has. Okay, so, uh, so Trump can be deterred. Thank you, Thomas. Yes, the risk, as I said before, seems to be more miscalculation than okay. anything else. Miscalculation as opposed to... Miscalculation does not suggest, by the way undeterability if that's no. a word kennedy kennedy had kennedy had the ability to be deterred mm -hmm. uh kennedy still engaged in a cuban missile crisis True. miscalculation and this is always the critique and it's a fair critique of having large nuclear arsenals and why i strongly support disarmament treaties mm -hmm. uh bilateral and multilateral disarmament we are, treaties. We are fans not, of disarmament treaties here on tangents yes i don't yeah i support multilateral disarmament i don't support unilateral disarmament i think that's a dumb thing but i support <laughs> multilateral disarmament for this reason uh that having that lowering all sides capabilities still is able to maintain deterrence which is an important thing but reduces the risks of miscalculation and the damage of miscalculation. Uh, and maybe at some point in a bright human future, if such a thing exists, uh, we could have a nuclear free world. But for the time being, we live with nuclear weapons. So Trump, the risk with Trump is, is miscalculation. And risk with Trump is miscalculation. Thank you, Thomas. Yeah. 
And now that does bring us to China. So, Thomas, what are China's views of this entire situation? What are China's goals here? Well, China does not want a united Korea, uh, as we've seen for 60 years. Uh, China also does not want a big war on the Korean Peninsula. So China is biased toward keeping its troublesome little relative uh, in its camp, but it also is strongly biased toward stability. Uh, I don't think there's any way to persuade China that United Korea is in its interest. I don't think, though, there is equally any way that China could be convinced that conflict on the Korean Peninsula could in some way benefit it. What China is scared of and doesn't want, and maybe the Chinese leadership has something in common with the Trump administration in this regard, is they are terrified of refugees. Refugees. Uh, and they don't want any refugees in China. They also don't want any radiation in China. No, they don't want that either. Um, but they really don't like refugees. Uh, China doesn't. And any war on the Korean Peninsula would result in it. There are 30 million North Koreans, mm -hmm. as we said. They could all flee over the border, and China doesn't want that. Right. So Beijing has been, has been very upset with Pyongyang, with the North Korean regime. Mm -hmm. It has said openly, and I'm going to do a little quoting from a, a wonderful source of news, um, the Global Times, which we can basically say speaks for the Chinese government, uh, right. which has said on multiple in multiple editorials, and they're always worth reading, by the way, because their writers don't speak English very well. Uh, Great. The Global Times has said on multiple occasions that Beijing really can't control North Korea. They tried. They cannot seem to control North Korea's behavior. They can't get North Korea to see that it's in its interests to cooperate and resume talks. Uh, they can't get it to see that it's in North Korea's interest to eventually disarm, which is why they participated in sanctions. Uh, mm. Trump seems to think that they can control North Korea. China says that it can't control North Korea. Would you China trust Trump or China in this in this case? Uh, I I think China probably can't control North Korea. I would, any, I would say that that's anymore. I don't think China can control. I don't think that the Chinese government can control Kim Jong Un any more uh, than Donald Trump's advisors or Congress can control. <laughs> him. I think that's probably that's a that's a pretty accurate comparison. That's an accurate and terrifying. There's comparison. a different. There's a vast differentiation of interests. There's a vast differentiation of perceptions. There's a vast differentiation of personalities uh, okay. in both cases. Right. Uh, so it is the case that China probably can't control North Korea. Uh, Beijing has been deeply, deeply, deeply critical of this escalating bellicose rhetoric coming from the U.S. president. Yes. President Xi of China, Xi Jinping, uh, has said that Trump uh, should avoid words and actions that escalate the situation. I'm going from the BBC and the Global Times here. Yes. He says the U.S. and China have common interests uh, in the DPRK. Those remarks uh, were actually very widely reported. Um, they're, they're very readily available in whatever preferred news source you have. Yeah, yeah. Uh, although the Global Times usually gets it first. Um, I wonder why that's I thought point. that an editorial from the Global Times at the beginning of this month was really telling mm -hmm. in its pronouncements about the Chinese position in regard to this issue. And I think this was issued just before the threat to Guam or just after it, but it okay. makes sense in either case. It sure. said, China should, I'm, I'm quoting from the Global Times here, China should also make clear that if North Korea launches missiles that threaten U.S. soil first and the U.S. retaliates, China will stay neutral. I repeat, China will stay neutral. That so China's is, not on our side on this. Though. I don't think China has ever said that before, that they would stay neutral if North Korea strikes first. No, That's a warning not. to Pyongyang. That is a clear warning to Pyongyang. Mm -hmm. But they also said this. If the U.S. and South Korea carry out strikes and try to overthrow the North Korean regime and change the political pattern of the Korean Peninsula, China will prevent them from doing so. So there was there. Were, this is China standing in the middle of these two irrational, you know, these two very frightening powers, mm -hmm. uh, Kim Jong Un and Donald Trump, saying, so, "Don't, don't do it." Uh, so I, I so, actually think, from Beijing's point of view, I don't right. necessarily like 
to Chinese government on human rights grounds and a lot of other issues. We are but not big fans of the this Chinese is a, government on human rights grounds here on Tangents. No, we're not. We, I'm pretty sure Tangents is blocked in China, and if it isn't uh, it will soon be. China, now it soon will be, and we take that as a badge of honor. But in this stance, I think China's being pretty reasonable, uh, if that is indeed its position. Right. So despite the fact that as of August 15th, North Korea has in fact backed down on their plans to test missiles near Guam, where do you see this going in the future, Thomas? Um, well, it can go in one of two directions. Okay. Uh, I think... Am I going to like both of the directions? No. Uh, there's, there's no great direction here. But okay. I think that North Korea benefits from the status quo, which is why I ultimately don't think I'm a little more optimistic that we're not going to see uh, the, the first nuclear break, the first nuclear war since uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki, mm -hmm. uh, because I think North Korea, North Korean regime benefits from the current position. It doesn't like the sanctions, but it benefits from having the world against it. The regime benefits mm -hmm. from being under siege at all times. The regime wouldn't benefit from a war with the United States, and so it wants to keep the status quo. Ultimately, for America, like any other problem we all have in our own lives, the more procrastination can be involved, the more that we can shift the focus away from this and just return to the deadlock that's happened before, uh, the U.S. would prefer that. Uh, so I think it's in the interest of both actors that you have, even if it's a, a sort of stable status quo. Right. Uh, and I tend to think that that's, that's the most likely situation. North and, Korea... And is, this, is this mutual benefit to the status quo part of the reason why you think Kim Jong-un and Pyongyang stepped down on launching missiles near Guam? Yeah, yes. Okay. Uh, but I don't know how long that status quo can be sustained right. if the North Korean weapons program is improving. It depends on how much of a threat America really perceives from it's, it and what they're really willing to do in part of it. So, if so they can maintain, if the if if okay. the Trump administration and if American administrations can maintain a sort of um, condemnatory dance, where they make it seem like they're upping deterrence, they make it seem like they're putting pressure on North Korea, where they make it seem like uh, they disapprove because we have an interest in in, in, in nuclear non-proliferation. They make it seem like mm -hmm. they're deterring this when, in fact, it doesn't make a difference for them if these nuclear weapons are indeed defensive, which the vast majority of nuclear weapons programs are defensive. Uh, yes. I, I personally think Saddam Hussein's nuclear weapons program was probably defensive. Its, its weapons of mass destruction program was intended against its own population, but the nuclear weapons programs are intended to preserve the regime, as I think I've established right. okay. pretty clearly. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. uh, if, a, if all sides can keep face from this, then you could maintain the status quo for a while until the North Korean regime collapses of its, of its own right. internal problems. Um, and the second situation is miscalculation and war. And oh, oh, I so, don't like that one. Yeah, so that's where we are. Okay, well, thank you, Thomas. Thank you. And now it's time for the intellectual buffet. Josh, what have you brought to the intellectual buffet? Well, Thomas, last week I know we worked out that I was going to bring uh, turkey to this intellectual buffet, but <laughs> I've decided to actually withhold my turkey from the intellectual buffet, and instead I am now going to tell you five seconds before the intellectual buffet begins that I am in fact bringing bologna to the intellectual buffet. I hope, I hope with all my heart that you're able to prepare for such a massive switch. No, I actually haven't. I'm not talking about turkey and bologna, of course, I'm talking about criminal justice reform. Oh, great. Two instances of criminal justice reform, as a matter of fact. The lawyer returns. The lawyer has never left the building. <laughs> <laughs> the judge has never left his chambers. So, so what is it this time? So it's not actually about the Justice Department this time. I'll spare you that one. Um, now it sure is that's about, a topic we'll be returning to, though. It is absolutely a topic we'll be returning to. Now it's about disclosure agreements with the, between the prosecution and defense, particularly two aspects of disclosure. One is a very, very, very troubling tradition of Brady law violations in certain courts, and I will talk about what that means. And the second is not quite entirely the same, but it's about 
only disclosing evidence directly before or very, very soon before trial and how the defense has to respond to that. So uh, this is, uh, I guess, following up on a series of articles in the New York Times by uh, Emily Bazelon. By Emily Bazelon. And the second article was actually not by Emily Bazelon. It was about a law in New York. It was by Beth. Oh my gosh, I'm going to butcher this last name. Beth Schwarzfappel. Schwarzfappel. Oh Something. my, that is a name. It's, 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 it's quite a name. I am. I apologize to to Beth Schwarzapfel. Yeah, Schwarzapfel. There we go. <laughs> For butchering her name the first probably four or five times I tried to say it. So the Bazelon article talks about um, a case in which a woman uh, named Nora Jackson was accused of killing her mother. And I believe convicted. She was in fact convicted. And, and sent to prison. And sent to prison. And that was only overturned after the fact that it was revealed that the prosecution had in fact deliberately and intentionally withheld exonerating evidence from the defense. Mm -hmm. This is called a Brady violation. Um, so how disclosure works for our non-legal friends, and, and Thomas, who's not a legal friend, is um, essentially the prosecution... I'm an illegal friend. <laughs> uh, possibly. Essentially, the prosecution has to disclose all evidence that is relevant or probe uh, relevant, which... Relevant evidence is either material, which is directly discussing the case at hand, or probative, which means that um, it leads to an increased probability of a certain outcome to the defense. It is at the prosecution's discretion as to what evidence is in fact disclosed to the defense. And in this case, the prosecution decided that a what what I think most people would describe as an integral piece of evidence was not disclosed to the defense at all, which means that if the evidence that the prosecution has is not disclosed to the defense, the defense cannot use the evidence in the trial. And I think we can see a problem if you don't give the defense the evidence they need to exonerate their clients. Thomas, can you see a problem with that? I think there's an extraordinary, extraordinary problem with that because there seems to be a conflict of interest uh, with uh, what the prosecutors have. The prosecutors have an interest in increasing the number of convictions. That's exactly. Uh, that's exactly. So right. it, it's it seems I'm going to use a word perverted, frankly, that they yes, have uh, would, that they have control over this that. evidence. I would I, entirely agree. With I, that. I I have to say. Uh, I can detect already a problem here, and by detect, I mean I read about it because uh, I don't know anything about this subject. I know, uh, but I'm a very course. curious person. Uh, is it? It's probably not entirely clear, though, Josh. What evidence uh, might be the kind that they would need to disclose to the prosecution or not? It's somewhat the subjective. Defense. It's not like it's labeled. It's not like it's labeled with red and green stickers here, and they have to give up all the green stickered evidence. No, which is why there's a single solution to this in my mind. And that solution is open books from the prosecution. Uh, I, I thought you were going to say uh, abandoning the common law system and going to a civil law system. Um, <laughs> we can talk about that some other time, but y it might actually not fix the problem. Uh, because while, yes, the problem is exacerbated by the fact that we have a common law system, which is an adversarial system, which means that the prosecution... I think, that, I think judges and lawyers dress better in a civil law system, personally. Uh, yes, the Anglophile speaks to us thank you thomas that, no that's the european that's the european style oh, of oh, dress oh pardon me the european style of dress they don't wear wigs in europe they, they have these wigs. sort of fluffy they have these sort of fluffy cravats that they wear thomas, uh, wear in denmark in france and in, in, in france thomas, and in the netherlands and thomas, so on but in britain they do wear wigs thomas i do not and that's common law thomas i do not look good in a fluffy cravat <laughs> okay <laughs> I may have to reconsider my career choice if we switch to a civil law system, which requires me to wear a fluffy cravat. Um, so, yes, the problem is exacerbated by the fact that we live in a common law system, which means that the prosecution's main goal is to defeat the defense, and the defense's main goal is to, quote, unquote, defeat and it's the it's adversarial. It's adversarial. That's exactly Which, you, this is exactly maybe exactly. one of the top five things you believe in more than anything else in the world. It is that The necessary system, adversarialness they, of the system, yes. Yes. <laughs> We, we, which we will talk about in another episode and probably 
forever because I do very strongly believe in this. So what an open book policy would essentially mean or an open evidence policy or an open disclosure policy would mean is the prosecution hands over all acquired evidence to the defense. And it is now the defense's it is now on the burden of the defense attorney to choose what evidence is in fact relevant, probative, material, etc. to his or her case. So that takes the burden away from the prosecution and gives it to the defense. It also gives the defense greater... It, it gives the system greater transparency and gives the defense greater access to not only evidence, but also to how the investigation was conducted in case they want to make a claim against that. It actually just overall fixes a lot of the problem that we have with this disclosure issue and Brady violations. In fact, I would go so far as to say that if we adopt this policy across the continental United States and in Alaska and Hawaii and all U.S. territories using the common law system, that it might make Brady violations and the like a thing of the past. And that would really, really help reform our criminal law system. I, you think it would make it a lot fairer toward people who are accused of Absolutely. crimes? Because right now um, we give prosecutors, I mean, th there's a movement in the United States. It's actually one of the few good things that happened during the 2016 election cycle to get more sort of liberal prosecutors who are interested in delivering justice and not just throwing people in prison. People arguing on a print a platform of fairness as opposed to tough on crime. Yes. yes. Yeah, tough on crime. We're we're against tough on crime here we're on Tangents. We're against tough tangents. on crime, but that does not mean we are soft on crime at Tangents. No, uh, no, because we believe we believe in the rule of law rather than in, in stigmatizing the idea of criminals as others who just need to be locked away. Law here on Tangents. Yes, we are. Uh, I think that goes without saying. <laughs> it does. But, um, there's been this movement to get more liberal prosecutors uh, in power, including this is backed by an effort by George Soros. Mm -hmm. uh, and that it might actually be, uh, you might actually be able to do more, make more of a difference as a prosecutor than as a defense attorney in this view. Do you, do you agree with that? I absolutely agree with that. So now on to my second piece of criminal law reform, which I'll try to keep short and brief because it's even more technical than this one so there are plenty of states uh, new york state is one of them uh, the new york times article that i was reading focused on new york gee i wonder why that might be um in which there are no laws that require what's known as an early disclosure of evidence by the prosecution to the defense. So even if we fix open book problems, we still haven't quite fixed the problem of disclosure. So the, the, there's actually, because there's a second problem with disclosure. Thomas, if I have a lot of evidence to disclose to you, and I disclose it a month before the trial, do you think you have enough time to formulate an argument based on that evidence? Probably not. What if I what if I only had to disclose it a week before the trial? Definitely not. I had to, to to just maybe full disclosure to our listeners. I might possibly have had a brief, very brief legal career uh, before <laughs> coming to tangents. And I can would it it would not surprise you to know, Josh. I'm sure that it takes years to prepare for a trial. Mm -hmm. Years, yes. Sometimes in big cases, and that particularly public defenders uh, don't have a lot of resources mm -hmm. in preparing for a trial. So not giving them, giving them a week would be very unfair. Yes. Um, so there's actually a big problem with this in states like New York, where it, it's called discover, uh, the process of disclosure of discovery of evidence and disclosure is actually just called discovery in general. Um, I have an issue less with the discovery of evidence and more with disclosure itself, so I tend to separate the two of them, but the process is just called discovery um, for mm -hmm. listeners' edification. Essentially, essentially, basically what you have is these prosecutors only have to disclose evidence to the defense and they, they push it back as late as possible because naturally we live in an adversarial system and it's the prosecution's job to try and convict the defense's client. So it gives so it, it, it is not a violation in like, in like a Brady law violation where it is actually against the law to withhold this evidence willingly. But you can't really prove that it was intentional because the prosecution has so much leeway in this situation that they just get to decide what evidence is essentially relevant, whatever it is is not relevant. It's... This is entirely according to the law, and the problem is, is that they just don't give enough time to the defense to formulate a, a proper argument based on the evidence that they're given. Evidence has to be excluded by the defense simply because they can't corroborate it and they can't incorporate it into their argument properly. 
And I think that we need to really, really push for earlier discovery and earlier disclosure because that means that the prosecution who's had this evidence for, let's say, five months before the defense now would have to give the defense the evidence around the same time they acquired it, which means that both the prosecution and the defense get an equal amount of time to examine the evidence and formulate their cases. Or if we're not, if we're going to say that, you know, we do in fact have an innocent until proven guilty system in the United States, so it's not necessarily completely fair that we give them equal time, we should at the very least give them almost equal time. Do you agree with that, Thomas? I do. Yeah, so criminal justice reform, a lot of it, a lot of it needs to come from prosecutorial reform and the reforms of practices of how we get evidence to defense attorneys. And that's what I brought to the Intellectual Buffet today. But Thomas, enough about me. What did you bring to the Intellectual Buffet today? So I have uh, something from uh, big countries and something from a small country. So I'm going to talk okay. first about Swedish defense. Um, Swedish defense. Yeah, uh, which is actually is that, more... is that is that a new type of of sweet from Sweden? No, it isn't. This is Sweden's military uh, Sweden and defense military? policy vis-a-vis -vis Russia, uh, which is more important than you might think. So, a trivia question for you, Josh: yes. Uh, yes. Can you name for me which Scandinavian countries are in the EU, which Scandinavian countries are in NATO, uh, and which Scandinavian countries are outside of those bodies. I mean, you know I can't. <laughs> Do you want to give it a shot? Uh, I'd rather not expose my ignorance of everything having okay. to do with Scandinavia. All right, so <laughs> which, how about this? Which Scandinavian countries were invaded by Nazi Germany and which one was neutral? Um, let's see. Switzerland was neutral. Switzerland is not a Scandinavian country. Oh, Switzerland is not a Scandinavian country. Um, okay, was Sweden the neutral one then? Yes, Jews fled to Sweden, notably. Jews did flee uh, to Sweden. Yeah, uh, because it's in between Finland, which is in a Soviet orbit. Finland was in a uh, Soviet orbit, was not yeah. it was was not invaded by the Nazis, I believe. They were they were allied with Finland. the Nazis. Yes, Finland. Yes, during the Winter War, but Finland yes. lost the Winter War. Remember, and were forced very... back over the border. Yep. Yeah, yeah. And, but Finland was able to maintain its autonomy, even though it was in the Soviet sphere. The and Soviets had a, a brief, control over its... There was a brief period after the Winter War where they launched an invasion of the Soviet Union, thinking that the they Red Army was still terrible. They did when Operation Barbarossa did, and it backfired horribly. There's some yeah, very... they were, they were but... soundly trounced. Also, Finland uh, considers itself a Nordic country, but Finns are not ethnically Germanic people. They're an ethnically Uralic people. Okay. But the, but uh, Norway and Denmark were invaded by Nazi yes, Germany. Sure. So Norway and Denmark are are not uncoincidentally now in NATO. Sweden right. was neutral during World War II and also neutral during the Cold War. It's Sweden not is NATO. not in NATO. Uh, Denmark and Sweden are in the EU. Norway is not in the EU. Norway, Sweden, and Denmark, none of them have the euro. Um, okay. And uh, so... Thank you for the information, Thomas. Yes. So Sweden is not in NATO. Right. Therefore, Sweden has to have its own deterrent capabilities against Russia. Mm -hmm. After the Cold War, Sweden cut military spending because it didn't perceive much of a Russian threat. Mm -hmm. A few years back in the mid-2000s, Sweden did away with national service, with the draft. Yes. Uh, when it would not draft uh, young men and women into its military because it didn't perceive the need for it anymore. However, recruitments fell uh, and Russia became more of a threat after the invasion of Crimea and after notably Russian jets and other defense exercises near the Baltics, which makes the Swedes very wary. And thus, mm -hmm. earlier this year in March, Sweden reinstituted the draft. Uh, oh. So Sweden is now taking is now taking recruits, I believe it is both men and women equally back. It is in fact both men and women equally, yes. Yeah, it is taking it, men and women equally back into its armed forces. Just a couple of days ago, uh, the Swedish coalition government led by uh, Social Democrat Prime Minister Stefan Löfven uh, announced uh, a 2.7 billion krona, uh, that's $334 million defense package to boost defense spending partly to pay for these new recruits. Now that, now that doesn't sound new, like a lot to the United States because we $334 have- $334 million dollars, uh, in defense spending is a lot for a country as small- It's a lot for Sweden. With a country of 10 million, about 10 million people yeah. in Sweden, a country that 
doesn't engage in international a warfare. A country that has less people in it than California. Yeah, it, a country that has less than a third uh, of the population of California. Yes, uh, it's so, quite a lot. Yeah, so that is a lot of money that Sweden's putting into its defense forces. Uh, and Sweden also does kind of cooperation with NATO sometimes. Mm-hmm. Um, it, there have been, Russia has been very critical of Sweden's increase in spending. Um, Vladimir Putin notably said that a Sweden in NATO, obviously Russia thinks everybody wants to join NATO. Uh, Vladimir Putin said that a Sweden NATO would be a threat to Russia. Uh, this is quoting from the Swedish Newswire TT. Um, so, uh, there's definitely been an increase in tensions. It's worth noting sure. that press, I think I, I'm not hundred percent sure of this. So I'm not going to bother double checking. I think president Obama had been scheduled to visit Russia at one point a couple of years ago right. and he canceled the visit to Russia and became the first U S president to visit Sweden, uh, on his own. Oh. Uh, so he went to Stockholm and held. This was before Stefan Lufen was prime minister. This is back when moderate uh, center right uh, Friedrich Reinfeldt was Thomas, still Thomas, Sweden. Thomas, uh, Thomas. So uh, Thomas. Sweden has been moving in a more American direction, but still Thomas, bad joke. Also, yeah. Could you say President Obama got Stockholm syndrome? <laughs> you might say. <laughs> you might say President Obama got Stockholm syndrome. So uh, <laughs> that's so uh, that's the latest news out of Sweden. Uh, and we might also say that Stefan Lofen is, is fighting an internal scandal regarding a huge leak of information from internal ministries that regarded that, that resulted in two cabinet ministers resigning. And there was a possibility that the social Democrat government might fall. Although is I there is, is there a Russian like, involvement in this leak potentially? Sorry? Is there a Russian involvement in this leak potentially? Uh, I don't think one has officially been uh, discovered, but that was everybody's first inclination. But it does show how vulnerable governments are to security. And again, this isn't a region. Estonia, most notably, has suffered Russian hacks in the past. Yes, absolutely. I also think we are also approaching a, a big historical anniversary. Okay. Uh, this is the 70th anniversary of India and Pakistan's independence from Britain. The British Raj... Uh, ended officially on August 15th, 1947. Mm-hmm. Mahatma Gandhi notably wanted a united India with Hindus and Muslims to emerge out from under British rule. Um, the leader of the Pakistani Muslim League, Muhammad Ali Jinnah, wanted to form an independent Muslim state called Pakistan. Ultimately, that's what happened. Mm-hmm. Uh, Gandhi predicted there would be an orgy of bloodshed, as indeed there was. About 10 million people were displaced because of what was called partition, and as many as two million may have died in religious violence. This is one of the darkest uh, episodes of the 20th century. It's one that's often overlooked. Uh, this so, was not so I shouldn't, I shouldn't make this a partition. This was entirely game. horrible religious violence and more violence connected to the ethnic movement of people so along the border. Thomas, you're saying I shouldn't make a cake and invite people over to celebrate the history, the, um, the anniversary of the India partition, is what you're saying. I don't, but uh, notably there could, are. Could I partition my cake? No, you should not partition your cake. I should not partition my cake. <laughs> yeah, uh, notably there have been um, celebrations in both country, but somewhat really jingoistic views of the past. Ah. Uh, in Pakistan, there's general denial that Muslims were engaged in violence. Likewise, in India, denial that uh, Hindus and Sikhs uh, Thomas, were engaged Thomas, in this. Thomas. Yeah. Would you condemn this violence on many sides? I I think that one legitimately, when looking at history, can say that there was violence on both sides here. It's not a hateful equivalency to say that. No. It's uh, not. And not only is it not a hateful equivalency, all of the really moving interviews I've heard from the BBC, NPR, and others on this anniversary have been with the few people who are still left to remember a uh, partition as it was happening. Both. Muslims and Hindus on both sides saying how deeply they regret violence, this violence that did occur. It's people who've been born since who've been kind of indoctrinated into real nationalist hatred of the other side in India and Pakistan that seem to have this false narrative of history. Okay, thank you, Thomas. And that's all the time we have today for the actual giant flaming ball of death. Thank you for listening and have a great rest of your week and tune back again next time.